Um, we are live. All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Peter. I'm one of the uh, incoming chief residents at UC Irvine. It's an honor and a privilege to uh, introduce today Dr. Jordan. Uh, he is our program director here at UC Irvine. So Dr. Jordan uh, did his undergrad at University of Toronto where he continued to get his MD. Then he did an internship at, at the hospital for sick children in Toronto and a residency uh, in, in urology at the University of Toronto followed by two fellowships. One was a clinical fellowship in renal transplant and renal vascular surgery at the Cleveland Clinic as well as a research fellowship in immunobiology and transplantation at the University of uh, Minnesota. Dr. Jordan was previously at the University of Toronto, University of Pittsburgh, uh, UMDNJ, where he was the uh, 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 Harris L. Uh, Willits Professor and uh, Chair uh, in the Division of Urology, and he's been at UC Irvine since 2013, where he's a clinical professor of urology and again, our residency program director, Dr. Jordan, has published around 200 uh, publications uh, in urology. And so uh, with that, I'll leave you with Dr. Jordan, who's gonna be presenting today on, on renovascular hypertension, uh, a talk that uh, he's given us residents uh, in the past and uh, it was always excellent. Well, thank you very much, Peter. It's very kind uh, of you to say those things. Um, it's a real pleasure to be uh, invited to participate in this lecture series. I see we have uh, some uh, increasing participants. We have about 11 participants so far. Hopefully we'll, we'll see more of you soon. Um, so uh, I appreciate the invitation. We're going to talk today about renovascular hypertension. I hope you guys can see me. I can't see myself. Um, and we're gonna have about a 45 minute uh, talk followed by some poll everywhere questions um, that uh, everybody is invited to participate in. I have no disclosures. Let's start off just by a definition. Uh, renovascular hypertension is something that as urologists, we really need to know about. And it's, it's very good review of both physiology as well as anatomy. But the definition is that elevated blood pressure is caused by occlusive disease of the renal arterial vasculature. And when you think about hypertension, actually hypertension is very common. It affects about a third of all US adults. But that includes essential hypertension. So renovascular hypertension is actually a form of secondary hypertension, which is hypertension that uh, is caused by uh, some other anatomic entity other than essential hypertension. So examples would be coarctation of the aorta, uh, Cushing's disease, pheochromocytoma, things like that. So secondary hypertension affects about 15% of adults but very common form of hypertension in children, up to 85% of hypertension in children. And if you think about it, it's likely because, you know, children just don't have enough uh, longevity to have developed essential hypertension yet. And most of the presentation in children is due to anatomic abnormalities or endocrine abnormalities and such. So if you look at renovascular hypertension specifically, it accounts for estimated uh, between 50 and 75 percent of all causes of secondary hypertension. So it's actually more common than we may appreciate when we think about it. So when we think about uh, renovascular hypertension, there's really several key questions, and that is, who should we be investigating? What's the optimum screening for this entity, and how do we treat it? And the first thing to, to just go over is a little bit of the history of how this entity was identified. And the first inkling that there might be a renal cause of hypertension was actually proposed uh, almost 200 years ago by Bright, and it was called Bright's disease in, in the early days. And in the late uh, 19th century, uh, investigators were able to uh, isolate renin 
And I'm going to pause for a moment. This, the pronunciation is renin, not renin. Renin is actually an enzyme found in calves' stomachs, which helps to curdle milk and is used to make cheese. So we're talking about renin, not renin. Um, then in the early 20th century, Butler, a surgeon named Butler, was able to cure a case of hypertension by performing an nephrectomy. And you have all uh, no doubt heard about the famous Goldblatt experiments. This was actually done again in the 1930s where uh, experimental clipping of a renal artery or clamping of a renal artery in uh, experimental animals, rats and dogs, was able to reproduce hypertension. So this kind of cinched the idea that um, hypertension could be caused by uh, the kidneys, by uh, certain elements produced by the kidneys. And it was identified that this was due to uh, the renin excuse me, renin angiotensin uh, mechanism. Then uh, also in the 30s, it was shown by man that you didn't really get a significant decrease in flow through the renal artery unless you had a narrowing over 50% internal diameter. Now I'm gonna show you two equations and I promise there won't be any more equations after this, but these are very important to remember. And that is, if you take a tube uh, and you cross-section it, the area of the cross-section is directly proportional to the square of the radius or the square of the diameter divided by four. The other thing I want you to remember, the other equation is Poisson's law, which describes the change in pressure gradient across a tube in this case, an artery. And you can see that this is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the radius. So the, the smaller the tube, the smaller the diameter, the greater in the pressure gradient. Now these other factors, this is a, a viscosity factor, this is flow, uh, this is a length of the tube, and Q is flow. So uh, just look at this diagram here for a minute. And you can see that the decrease in surface area and the decrease in diameter don't parallel each other. But when you reach a 50% decrease in diameter, you now have about a 70% decrease in surface area. And it is only at this point that the flow begins to decrease. So this explains the observation that if you do an arteriogram, for an example, and you see a 50% narrowing, in terms of the diameter, the flow still may be maintained through that vessel. But as the diameter narrows, you've got a, an asymptotic drop in flow, and eventually you have no flow. So this is why the observation that are seen on many arteriograms don't necessarily correlate with significant decrease in flow, and you can't just rely on the anatomic picture of the arteriogram to make the diagnosis of renal artery stenosis with, with significant decrease in flow. So just remember that Poisson's law describes a change in pressure gradient. So what's the pathophysiology of uh, renal vascular hypertension? How does this happen? Well, you've got decreased renal perfusion through the renal artery due to the stenosis. This leads to a decreased GFR because you've got less perfusion through the glomerulus. In addition to this, because you've got decreased perfusion, you've got decreased sodium delivery in the uh, convoluted tubule. And as you recall the anatomy, the convoluted tubule is right next to the macula densa in the Jessica glomerular apparatus. And this results in an increased secretion of uh, prostaglandins, which then stimulate renin production from the uh, Jessica glomerular cells. Now there's two other mechanisms that lead to increased renin production, that's sympathetic nerve tone and baroreceptors. But in this case, it's decreased sodium delivery to the, to the uh, distal tubule that is the primary mechanism. And what happens when you've got increased renin secretion? 
And if you remember this uh, standard algorithm, uh, renin is an enzyme that cleaves angiotensinogen, which is manufactured in the liver, producing angiotensin 1, which then circulates throughout the uh, uh, vascular system until it ends up in the lung. And as you know, with COVID, there's supposedly a binding of the COVID to the angiotensin converting enzyme, which is in the lung, which is supposedly why it has a predilection for affecting uh, the lungs primarily. But captopril, for example, is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, and uh, this will prevent the formation, the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. But once angiotensin II is formed, you get primary vasoconstriction. You also get increased aldosterone and, and a result in sodium retention. So there's two mechanisms that the secretion of angiotensin II can cause hypertension. So when you've got unilateral renovascular hypertension, you have increased renin, sec renin secretion from that kidney. You've got suppression of contralateral renin release you've got decreased renal blood flow, and you've got increased angiotensin II production. So in thinking about this, Goldblatt, modif uh, the experiment of Goldblatt was modified by Brunner in 1971 to see if he could differentiate between unilateral and bilateral renovascular disease. So the traditional model is the two kidney model where both kidneys are functioning, and he was able to show that if you gave animals an angiotensin II inhibitor, you uh, basically had a fall in blood pressure because there is a normal contralateral kidney showing that the hypertension was renin mediated. But if you have a solitary kidney, or for example, a transplant kidney, which is a solitary kidney, if you gave these uh, animals an angiotensin II inhibitor, the blood pressure didn't change, unless the animals were sodium depleted first, showing that this was a sodium mediated hypertension or volume mediated hypertension. So just try to remember that with a two kidney model and unilateral stenosis, the hypertension is renin angiotensin dependent. But if you have bilateral disease, or a solitary kidney, the hypertension is now volume or sodium dependent. It's not, it's initially accompanied by increased renin secretion, but eventually the, uh, the hypertension becomes sodium dependent. Let's go over some characteristics of renovascular hypertension. So as you, uh, as you probably know, there's two major causes uh, renal artery disease. That is due to atherosclerosis, and this is the vast majority, about 80% of all patients with renovascular hypertension have atherosclerotic disease. And interestingly, if you look at coronary arteriography, which is done fairly commonly now, about 10% of patients have incidental findings of atherosclerotic renal artery disease. But most of these are not clinically significant. They're incidental findings. Fibromuscular disease is the other major form of renovascular hypertension. And this is in approximately 20% of all cases. And it probably comprises about 5 to 10% of all cases of secondary hypertension. Now, there's some other less common causes of renovascular hypertension, for example, uh, vasculitides, extrinsic compression from tumor or fibrosis, secondary to radiation. Um, but these are relatively uncommon. So as a clinician, what are some of the factors when a patient presents with hypertension that might suggest it's due to a renovascular cause? Well, um, young age is one, and all children. Short duration of hypertension. If the hypertension is very rapid onset, it's more likely to be renovascular than due to something else. It could be uh, other causes as well, such as a pheochromocytoma, but you have to keep that in mind. And evidence of preceding trauma, perhaps. Resistance to medical therapy, but bear in mind that up to 
of patients who are on medical therapy are non-compliant. So this may be a factor. If you have imaging, you will perhaps see asymmetric kidney size, more than 1.5 centimeter difference in size. And then finally, an un any unexplained decline in GFR, especially if a patient has been started on an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker, this is going to bring out any pre-existing renovascular uh, disease. So how do we uh, approach the diagnostic evaluation? really shouldn't investigate patients uh, unless you're going to consider a corrective procedure if you detect evidence of renovascular hypertension. Now the caveat of course is that most of us as urologists do not perform the initial evaluation. These patients are sent to us uh, generally in the past we used to see them more primarily. Now with the advent of uh, angioplasty and stenting we don't see the, these patients all that often anymore unless the angioplasty or stenting has failed. And then the second point is, even if you have a patient who you suspect has renovascular disease, there's no point really in investigating them if they're asymptomatic with good blood pressure control and normal renal function, because the treatment is going to be medical if they're uh, continuing medical therapy. So there's no point in putting them through a gamut of uh, investigations if you're not going to actually change the therapy. So here are some of the initial diagnostic evaluations. And those of you who are a little older like me remember in the uh, early days, we used to go right to angiography. Well, we don't do that anymore because Doppler ultrasound is highly uh, sensitive and specific depending on the anatomy of the patient. However, in most patients, um, the advantages are non-invasive. You can assess blood flow velocity. You can follow the patients easily. You can do the test serially. Unlike an angiogram where you don't want to be subjecting a patient to serial arteriography to follow this. Also, it's fairly useful in azotemic patients who otherwise would have to have a contrast uh, procedure. Disadvantages, it's of limited utility in uh, patients with a high BMI, and of course it's operator dependent. So if, if we look at um, some of the parameters, um, in the radiologic literature, there was a paper about 13 years ago, and we kind of adhere to this, that if you have a greater than 200 centimeter per second peak systolic velocity, this is usually indicative of a renal artery stenosis, and this has a positive predictive value of about 80%. Now, some of the other uh, benefits of ultrasound is sometimes you can pick up uh, unusual anatomy that might be causing hypertension or shunting, such as an arteriovenous fistula or an AV malformation. So this is why we usually recommend, if you're gonna screen someone, start with a Doppler ultrasound. Uh, the more invasive testing, which can be used for more specific diagnosis if you've identified an abnormality on a Doppler ultrasound, would be a 3D uh, CT angiogram. It's about 90% sensitive. It provides, however, indirect information about blood flow. It just shows anatomy. Also, there's a lack of anatomic definition distal to the main renal artery. And of course, you need to use contrast. So that's of limited use in most patients who have atherosclerosis, because usually they do have some decrease in renal function. What about MR or MR angiography? This is also quite specific and sensitive, but again, similar to the CT, it does lack definition, distal to the main renal artery. Now, uh, one of the advantages is with some of the group two uh, newer agents, uh, we don't have to worry about nephrogenic systemic uh, fibrosis with elevated cranning. So what used to be a disadvantage is no longer has that disadvantage. And here's an example of an MRA. This is a normal MRA. Here, this shows you what a renal artery stenosis looks like. But you can see it's not, it's not highly definitive 
it gives you a, an idea, but it doesn't give you good specific anatomic detail. So here's the renal arteriogram, which is the so-called gold standard, showing uh, a renal artery stenosis fairly discreetly on, on the right side here. But uh, obviously this is invasive, it uses contrast, but if you're planning definitive treatment, such as angioplasty or surgery, you're gonna need this. An older study that we used to use more extensively was captopril renography. And this is done with uh, a renal nuclear medicine scan and utilizes the administration of captopril to bring out uh, drops in GFR, as I explained earlier, uh, which will help to uh, identify the area of stenosis and the kidney that's affected. This is useful only historically to review, mainly because we don't use it all that much anymore, but it helps explain the renin-angiotensin uh, mechanism a little bit. So if you look at a normal glomerulus, you've got an afferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole, and you've got filtration with the resultant GFR. If you now have a renal artery stenosis of the afferent uh, arteriole, you've got angiotensin II release, as explained uh, before, and you've got vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole, which helps to maintain perfusion pressure through the Bowman's capsule and maintain the GFR. But now, if you give captopril, you remove that angiotensin II, and the post-glomerular vasoconstriction is now removed. So you've got some dilation of this efferent arteriole, but the afferent arteriole is still stenotic. So the result is you've got a decreased GFR. So when you administer captopril, that's why you see an, a drop in GFR or an increase in serum creatinine. Also explains why you don't want to give uh, angiotensin II inhibitors to patients with uh, renal artery stenosis. And here's an example of uh, captopril renography uh, with a decreased perfusion of the affected kidney. The problem with captopril renography, it's pretty low sensitivity and specificity, uh, only about 80%. Uh, there's really not much anatomic information. You can't really use it in azotemic patients because it's gonna exacerbate the azotemia. Also, it's not really helpful in, in uh, workup of bilateral disease or children. Its main use might be at this point to determine whether you have any residual function in a kidney that you're thinking of removing to manage the hypertension. Plasma renin activity, simple test, blood test. You have to remember it's inversely related to sodium intake. In order to have an accurate test, you have to stop any hypertensive drugs for at least two weeks before, which is quite impractical in a lot of these patients. And you're also supposed to index it to sodium excretion. So it's got a high false negative and false positive, which can occur in essential hypertension. So we don't really use it that much anymore. It's an easy test, may be used as a screening test, but it's, it's not very specific. And you may have remembered hearing about differential renal vein sampling, this was promulgated by Derekot Vaughn, who was the chairman of urology at Cornell for quite a while. And this uh, basically looked at renal vein renin sampling from one kidney versus the other kidney and comparing it to the uh, renin level in the inferior vena cava. And the, the ratio greater than 0 0.5 would imply that there is increased renin coming from uh, a diseased kidney. With essential hypertension, you get a 0.25 ratio in both kidneys. But the disadvantage is that it's invasive. It doesn't really add anatomic detail other than localizing where the uh, hyperrenanemia is coming from. So we don't um, use it that much anymore. So it's rarely used. Let's move on now to uh, how do we approach treating renal vascular disease. So there's two important things to consider. One is the natural history of the disease, which we're gonna talk about briefly. And one, the second thing is to compare the results of medical versus interventional therapy. So our, we have to remember our overall aims with this 
are to control hypertension and to preserve renal function. So let's again compare the fibromuscular diseases to the atherosclerotic diseases, which are the majority. So typically the fibrous diseases occur in younger females who have no family history and the lesions tend to be fairly distal in the renal artery and there's very little to any uh, target organ damage, meaning uh, uh, damage to the eyes, damage to the heart, coronary artery disease, et cetera. Atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis, on the other hand, generally occurs in older males who have a family history of this. The lesions tend to be proximal. Remember that the atherosclerosis uh, occurs in the aorta and the proximal renal artery. And these patients do have fairly significant target organ damage. So many of them have coronary artery disease and other areas of atherosclerosis, strokes, et cetera. So we're gonna first just focus on atherosclerosis because it's much more common. And it's, again, usually part of a generalized atherosclerotic disease. Up to about 10 to 20% of patients with generalized atherosclerosis have, have a, a lesion in one of the renal arteries. There's also a risk factor for cardiac events. And although these are proximal uh, isolated lesions, they can progress in about a quarter of patients to complete occlusion in about 10%. The management is primarily medical. However, there may be a role for angioplasty and surgery in selected cases. So let's look at this. So for example, you can see that this is, this is a digital subtraction angiogram. You can see a tortuous atherosclerotic aorta, and there's a, a very high, uh, high level occlusion or narrowing of the main renal artery here probably a 90% stenosis, but you can see there is flow beyond it. So there are either collaterals or there's post-stenotic dilatation going on. So this, this uh, patient ended up having an angioplasty and the results are good initially at least. The problem is the long-term results of angioplasty with atherosclerosis Although there's, there was good initial technical su success described, a lot of these patients didn't have an improvement in blood pressure, and about 25% of them had complications requiring subsequent intervention. And there's also a small but significant mortality. And finally, there's recurrence in up to 35% of these patients, especially with osteal lesions, because it's very hard to successfully dilate an osteal lesion. So in the late, so angioplasty actually became very popular in the early 90s and subsequently stenting also uh, came into vogue. And angioplasty and stents were a little bit controversial. A randomized trial was done in the, the late 90s showing that the success with stenting, which is PTRS, uh, was actually much higher than angioplasty alone with a much lower restenosis rate. So there was widespread adoption of angioplasty with stenting for atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis in the late 90s and early 2000s, it became basically the primary treatment mode and was done with increasing frequency. However, in the following decade, the results became a little less enthusiastic, which led to several trials comparing medical management to angioplasty with stenting. And the most um, quoted of these trials is the so-called CORAL trial of 2014. I'm gonna show you a little bit about that. So this is from the New England Journal of Medicine where it was published. Large number of patients enrolled in both arms of the study, about 500 in both arms. And the key finding was the event-free survival was actually identical, whether these patients received medical therapy alone or medical therapy plus stenting. And events included things such as myocardial infarction, stroke, etc. This just shows the data in a little more detail. Uh, you can see that um, looking at the different 
at primary endpoints as well as secondary endpoints uh, were essentially identical in both the stenting group and the uh, medical therapy group. So this led to a, a somewhat decreased popularity of stenting for atherosclerotic disease uh, with only uh, it being done in selected cases. So what about surgery? Is there a role for surgery in the correction of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis? Well, again, going back to the 70s and 80s, um, there was some enthusiasm. This was, of course, before angioplasty and stenting was possible. So these patients were operated on for, uh, infre infrequently, but they were operated on. And you can see that some studies showed uh, cure rates and improvement rates in hypertension, but not what we would consider to be uh, fantastic results in today's day and age. But there were a number of pioneering surgeons, including two urologists, uh, Andy Novick and John Libertino at uh, Leahy, who were well known for performing these revascularization procedures with atherosclerotic disease. As the situation has evolved over time, we really don't have a lot of indications for uh, operating on these patients, unless you have a high-grade stenosis which affects the entire renal mass. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, for example, bilateral disease with more than 75% stenosis or stenosis in a solitary kidney, which is affecting renal function. So if, for example, these patients are not candidates for uh, stenting, or if they have failed stenting, and they're on the brink of dialysis, there may be an indication to uh, try a revascularization procedure. This was actually looked at at the Cleveland Clinic about 20 years ago, 23 years ago. And they had a group of patients with borderline uh, end-stage renal disease, CKD3 or 4, and we would call it now. And um, revascularization was done and they found that they actually could preserve renal function in some of these patients. It was most beneficial if serum creatinine was under three, but it was probably not warranted if the serum creatinine was over four. So that covers basically the current thoughts on atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Let's look at uh, fibrous disease, which is again, about 20% of all renal artery stenosis. The incidence is actually um, higher than we might think. In some studies of uh, workup of asymptomatic renal donors who generally receive an angiogram or a digital subtraction angiogram prior to donation, an incidence of around 5% of uh, uh, fibromuscular disease was found. And actually, we can use those kidneys because we can uh, take the renal artery uh, proximal to where the stenosis is and still use it as long as there isn't branch disease. So fibrous disease is bilateral in about a third of patients and again, very much more common in females than in males. So you've all heard about the so-called string of beads appearance or fibromuscular disease. This is, this is what's seen in medial fibroplasia, which is by far the most common type of uh, fibrous disease. They usually don't form collateral circulation. Um, they're often bilateral. The disease can progress, but rarely to occlusion. Um, and there's a relatively low risk of progressive renal deterioration. So this is one of the good ones. If you're gonna have fibromuscular disease, medial fibroplasia is actually a good one to have because it's easily treated. There are a couple of bad actors with the fibrous diseases. Intimal fibroplasia is, is one. True fibromuscular hyperplasia, which is very, very rare. It's only about 3%. This is actually due to hypertrophy of the muscle within the media as opposed to medial fibroplasia, which is fibrous disease. And then you have perimedial subadventitial fibroplasia also can progress 
and cause renal deterioration and aneurysm formation. So uh, for these patients, it's recommended to go ahead with either angioplasty or if needed, if angioplasty fails, surgery. The caveat is if you have branch disease identified, that is in the secondary renal arterial branches, surgery is actually preferred because it's very difficult to successfully uh, perform angioplasty on the branches. Here's some pictures which uh, you can take uh, away. Uh, on the left-hand side is, a, is a, uh, uh, an MRA, and on the right-hand side is a digital subtraction angiogram of the same renal artery. So the top panel, I, unfortunately my pointer stopped working, so you're gonna have to follow me along here, sorry. The top panel shows intimal fibroplasia, which you can see is a uh, discrete narrowed area, isolated over a segment. This is very amenable to uh, angioplasty. Medial fibroplasia, which is of course the string of beads appearance, and you can see it is uh, associated with uh, with alternating bands of narrowing and dilation of the main renal artery. Uh, the narrowing and dilation are, are smaller and greater than the diameter of the normal renal artery, respectively. And this can be also treated with stenting. And then perimedial fibroplasia, which actually has narrowing and uh, aneurysm formation but it's over a much shorter uh, area and of higher degree than medial fibroplasia. So it can be a little bit hard to distinguish uh, medial fibroplasia and perimedial fibroplasia just from the uh, x-rays alone. So how do you treat fibromuscular disease? Well, angioplasty is really the initial treatment of choice for patients who don't have complications. And by complications, I mean aneurysm formation and branch disease. The expected technical success is over 90%. Complication rates are low. And restenosis can occur, but it's acceptably low. You can re-dilate these patients. You don't need to do stenting. It used to be that all these patients were stented as well. It was subsequently found that uh, you know, angioplasty alone is really enough to sustain these patients. Stenting is indicated if there's treatment failure or a complication for an ability to eliminate the pressure gradient or dissection of the artery, which can also lead to uh, surgery being needed. Or in patients who restenose after angioplasty alone, uh, that's an indication for stenting. Now there's a subgroup of patients that should have surgery, and these are Few and far between, but they can occur. So angioplasty failures, dissections, perforations, these can be medical emergencies. I've taken care of a few of these. Um, there uh, can be life-threatening if somebody perforates the renal artery, of course. Um, branch disease, aneurysm formation, these should be operated on. And most studies show that surgical revascularization has a very good outcome for fibromuscular disease, unlike atherosclerotic disease. So I'm going to now take you through uh, the fun part, for me at, at least, which is the history of uh, surgical therapy for renal vascular disease. I'm going to give you a little uh, surgical history tour and um, uh, show you some nice pictures of some cases. And again, a lot of uh, urologists, most urologists don't do these procedures anymore. Uh, they're usually in the hands of the vascular surgeons, but some of us who were trained in uh, renal vascular disease and transplant uh, have done quite a few of these and continue to do them on occasion. So the first endarterectomy for renal artery stenosis was done in the 50s by Freeman. Segmental resection and anastomosis uh, was then done, and splenorenal bypass was done. This was all in the uh, mid to late 60s. And uh, the famous Dr. DeBakey uh, wrote a series uh, of uh, some of these procedures with 81% improvement in, in uh, hypertension. 
there's several options of uh, revascularization. Uh, and I'm going to go through some of these examples. So this is an example of an aorto-renal bypass. So you can see the, uh, the kidney has a little window in Gerota's fascia, so we can see the color of the parenchyma when it's revascularized. You can see the left renal vein going across here. And what this is, is this is a saphenous vein graft with two branches of the renal artery attached to it. And you can see we, at that point, we were using uh, silk sutures. And this proximal saphenous vein is sewn into the aorta. And then the renal ar artery branches are sewn, in this case, end to side and end to end into the uh, branch graft. So this is an example of an aorta renal bypass. So aorta renal bypass was actually a mainstay of, uh, of surgery for these patients. Some people use saphenous vein grafts, others used arterial autografts. And you can see how the success rates were quite good at that time. Problem with the saphenous vein graft was subsequent dilation or stenosis would occur in about a quarter to a half of these. Uh, so people shifted towards doing arterial autografts. Now, what's an arterial autograft? This is like a hypogastric artery graft. So you can actually remove someone's uh, internal iliac or hypogastric artery and use it as a bypass graft. Um, splenorenal bypass is also an option. Uh, obviously, you can only do it on the left kidney. The advantage is it only involves one anastomosis. You don't need to mobilize the aorta. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example of that. Now, this was quite a, an interesting case that I had when I was at the University of Pittsburgh. This would have been in the uh, mid-90s. And you can see you've got, you don't see a kidney on this side. You might see an ostium of renal artery here. Uh, but you've also got a stenosis of the other side. Uh, which is somewhat hard to appreciate, but this is an atherosclerotic aorta. And you can see how tortuous even the iliac arteries are. So you might say, well, why would you know, even treat this? But there, there was some perfusion um, on a CT scan. Here's the kidney. Here's the main renal artery here. You can see the origin of it on the left, and then it kind of just peters out. So this kidney must have had collateral circulation. It does have uh, not very good function on a scan, and I'm almost uh, embarrassed to show this case because probably today you'd say, well, just take that kidney out, what's the point? Well, the point was this patient's serum creatinine was around two at this point. Uh, there was probably 15% for perfusion of this kidney, but we decided we would give it a shot. So we, uh, we actually did a splenorenal bypass here, and you can see the splenic artery here which is isolated on a vessel loop. You can see how close the splenic artery actually runs to the renal artery. So here's the main renal artery. Here's where it peters out. This is the left renal vein. And then what we ended up doing is to swing the splenic artery end to end into the main renal artery. And here's the anastomosis right here. And there was perfu good perfusion of the kidney. And this is what the post-operative angiogram looked like. Here's where the anastomosis, the anastomosis would have been right about here. And this is an angiogram that was done three months after the splenorenal renal bypass. So you can see this kidney actually has pretty nice perfusion here. Um, and the creatinine was maintained in that patient. So you would probably never see that operation today, but I just wanted to show it to you historically uh, and show you some of the anatomy and what's feasible when you mobilize the splenic artery. What about end arterectomy? End arterectomy can be done, but it's really only recommended for atherosclerotic disease. It's associated with uh, relatively significant mortality because remember, most of these patients have systemic atherosclerotic disease. So we don't really do it anymore. Segmental resection and reanastomosis, that can be done for focal lesions, mid to distal lesions. But the problem is, again, 
It's just like when you're doing a ureteral ureterostomy, you have to be careful to mobilize both ends so that you don't do the anastomosis under tension. And the renal artery is a lot shorter than a ureter. So again, this is very, very rarely done anymore. Aorta renal reimplantation. Now this is not the same as a um, aorta renal bypass. This is direct reimplantation of the renal artery somewhere else into the aorta. Again, it's probably limited to very isolated cases, short proximal lesions. The advantage is it does have one anastomosis. And finally, uh, a procedure which is uh, dear to my heart because it involves transplantation, and that is autotransplantation, which can be done for middle aortic syndrome, Takayasu's disease, a surgically uh, inoperable aorta, where you do have preservation of the iliac vessels, or extensive branch disease requiring bench surgery, and in some cases, um, uh, other syndromes, uh, such as nutcracker syndrome, which is not specifically a renal artery stenosis, but autotransplantation is something to have in your surgical armamentarium, uh, which we can still utilize today. So we actually had a series when I was at the Cleveland Clinic uh, where we did auto transplantation. Uh, and this was in a group of pediatric patients actually that was published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery where these patients were, did very well. So this is the principle. Uh, you are able to harvest the hypogastric artery with several branches intact. Uh, then you reverse this artery, you, you have the kidney and you put it in an ice slush solution, you perfuse it, you reverse the hypogastric artery, sew it into these uh, diseased branches after having excised the area of disease. And then once you finish reconstructing the kidney, you sew it back into the uh, uh, iliac vessel on the same side where the hypogastric artery was, was ligated and you reperfuse the kidney. So it's just like a kidney transplant, really. You also obviously have to uh, reattach the renal vein and ureter. Um, on occasion, you can do this ex vivo, you can do this on the, uh, uh, on the patient without actually removing the kidney from the patient, you can do it in situ. But if the anastomosis is going to take more than uh, 45 minutes, you want to do it on ice slush solution and then do a formal auto transplant. So here's the end result here. This is uh, actually the same case, uh, real, real time or live picture showing this is the reverse hypogastric artery with three different branches here. And then this is a post-op digital subtraction angiogram showing the, the perfusion. Here's an example of a very complex case. So this is my last uh, series of of slides here. So this patient actually had two renal arteries, um, upper and lower pole, and you can see the extensive branch disease with aneurysm formation here and in the lower pole here. So this patient had a uh, auto transplant, but you can see a complex repair here with a, this is a saphenous vein graft actually with several anastomosis to it and this is the uh, this is the renal vein here um, these are the upper pole branches which have been reconstructed lower pole branches reconstructed and that can be then auto transplanted there's other types of procedures which are used more rarely and that's ileorenal bypass which you're using a graft from the iliac arteries uh, mesenterorenal from the uh, superior mesenteric artery, obviously end to side, not end to end, and hepatorenal. And here's an example of a hepatorenal bypass. Uh, this was done to the gastroduodenal artery branch of the hepatic artery using a piece of saphenous vein. So this is sort of equivalent to a splenorenal bypass for the right side because there's no splenic artery on the right side, but there is a hepatic artery. Finally, obviously, in some cases, you just have to bite the bullet and take the kidney out to cure the hypertension. So here are some of the indications for that. Small kidney, less than eight centimeters, 
main renal artery occlusion with no collateral circulation at all, severe nephrosclerosis. Now this sometimes requires a biopsy. Uh, sometimes we would do intraoperative biopsies when we were thinking of uh, revascularizing a kidney. But if we saw that the kidney didn't look very well, we would do a, a biopsy. And if it was uh, over 50% sclerosis on a frozen section, we would just take the kidney out. And then in a high risk patient with a normal contralateral kidney and segmental renal infarction, sometimes the uh, better part of valor is to just do a nephrectomy. What, now what I uh, didn't talk about here was robotic or laparoscopic approaches to this. You can do a, a hand-assisted laparoscopic autotransplant or robotic autotransplant. Those have been done. They're very time-consuming, um, but feasible. Um, and some of these bypasses might be well-suited to robotics, but there's very little uh, literature on that right now because the indications for doing these cases are not uh, that common. So here's the, some take home messages for renal vascular hypertension. Remember the majority of renal vascular hypertension is due to atherosclerotic disease. Don't investigate patients who are asymptomatic or who have good blood pressure control with normal renal function. Stenting shows no benefit over medical therapy for atherosclerotic disease. This was shown by the big Corral study in 2014. These patients are probably best served by continuing medical therapy unless they have complications. Fibromuscular disease, angioplasty alone is very effective. Stenting is not necessary. However, in those patients with fibromuscular disease who have progression of disease or branch disease or aneurysms or angioplasty complications, or in selected cases of uh, ischemic nephropathy, surgery can be indicated. And don't forget nephrectomy, which is also an option in certain patients. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, you enjoyed this. And, um, I think you're supposed to scan the last side, uh, slide here to do a survey. I'm gonna hand this back to Dr. Gamarian, who's um, gonna show you some poll questions, I believe. All right, um, do you wanna do the Q and A uh, first or the- Sure, uh, yeah. does anybody- so yeah, we have let's a couple see, uh, of There's some Q&As down here, I guess. Yeah, so let's see. The first question is, uh, is there a direct pressure measurement in the renal artery? Um, and so how do you know if angioplasty has achieved an improvement in the pressure gradient? That's a great question. And the radiologists are able, when they're interventional radiologists are able to measure this directly uh, while they're doing the angioplasty, and that's how they determine if it's successful or not. So the answer is yes. I can't tell you exactly how they do it, but they, they are able to measure pressure through the uh, catheter, uh, both before and after. Uh, I'm, I assume it's uh, attached to a transducer uh, while they're doing the uh, procedure, and they can measure the pressure directly. Now that doesn't tell you if it's gonna be a sustained improvement or not, but it tells you during the procedure. All right, great, thank you. And so the uh, second question uh, is, where do you think the role of robotics is important? Well, you know, I think that um, you, you still have to, if, if you're doing an auto transplant, you still have to remove the kidney and dissect out the branches on the back table. So I'm not sure if robotics is really necessary or important for that, because you are gonna to have to work on the kidney on the back table. Um, I personally don't have any experience in doing robotic revascularization of the kidney, and I don't think there is any literature on that that I've come across. Most of the vascular surgeons who are doing these procedures are doing them open, but I think it's something that may be uh, worth exploring because of the precision with which you can perform an anastomosis. Uh, 
uh, with, with the robot. The disadvantage of um, any robotic procedure, I think, renal vascular procedure, including transplant, is you cannot uh, adequately cool the kidney. And that's when you've got an occluded vessel, it's very important to be able to cool the kidney. So I, one of the things I didn't mention is when we're doing some of these renal artery uh, reconstructions, if we uh, ligate the renal artery, we do cool the kidney during, during that portion of the procedure. So I think there's been some uh, attempts to cool kidneys with ice jackets robotically, but most, most of those have not been that successful. So I think that's where the limitation of robotics is. And, you know, when I, um, one of the things that bothers me about robotic partial nephrectomy, although everybody does it, is that you can't cool the kidney and you lose that option, which you really only have with open partial nephrectomy. So I think that for me, the role of robotics in, in this, in renal vascular reconstruction is somewhat limited. Uh, I, it is being done for kidney transplants, but I think it's more of a technical exercise than really offering any advantage over uh, open procedures at this point. So there's right. a question about renal vein ren renal yeah. vein renin sampling. Yeah, so renal vein uh, renin sampling can be used to help diagnose adrenal adenoma based hypertension, but how do you differentiate this from renal vascular hypertension? So, um, there's no doubt that you know you can use renal vein renin sampling for both of these uh, entities, but the thing is, you're you're not you're you're using um, you've got an adrenal mass, so you really are, are dealing with a different entity than a renal artery stenosis. So generally, you know you have some other form of Im imaging which shows you an adrenal mass versus a renal artery stenosis. So I'm not sure I quite understand the question because you, you know you're dealing with an adrenal mass in, in this case. Uh, and so you, what you're looking for is increased uh, renin product. Uh, you're looking for aldosterone and renin secretion from the adrenal gland uh, based on drainage into the renal vein or the vena cava. So I'm, I'm, not sure what, I'm not sure what the question really is. All right, and then so the last one uh, is uh, a comment. Fibromuscular dysplasia and renal artery atherosclerosis may cause blood flow turbulence. In these cases, Brazil's law does not apply. That's absolutely correct, and I didn't have time to mention that, but if you look at the formula for Poisson's law, it depends on, lama on two things, which with renal artery stenosis doesn't have, and that is laminar flow, which is, I think, what this question is referring to. You've got turbulence, turbulent flow. So you do need laminar flow for Poussey's law to, uh, to be in effect. The other thing you need is you need uh, constant viscosity. So, for example, with blood, you don't have constant viscosity. It depends on hematocrit. It depends on a lot of other things. So Ms. Dr. White is, is absolutely correct. but Poisson's law is used as an approximation to give you an idea of the effects of the difference in pressure gradient depending on radius. But as far as applying it directly, you're absolutely correct. It only applies, for example, to a pipe with water flowing through it. So you've got lamp or some other laminar flow situation without turbulence and with constant viscosity. All right, I think those are our, I think those are our questions there. Um, I believe for our poll portion, uh, Michelle, are you uh, able to do uh, the poll? Ready for the poll everywhere? Okay, uh, Peter, do you want to read the questions or should I? Uh, let's see where 
Do you see the question? I had it, uh, but I went to unmute and now I don't see it. Sorry. Can, I, uh, can everyone see the questions there? So the uh, questions are Poisson's law. This is now referring to the last question we had. Uh, describes blood viscosity, blood flow, pressure gradient, or surface area. Okay, the correct answer is the pressure gradient um, for the reason we just uh, mentioned. Uh, blood flow is obviously a consequence of the narrowing, but flow is one of the, blood flow is one of the parameters in the equation, but the actual uh, determinant that's being uh, measured is pressure gradient. Okay, second. Oh, this is the second question, but it's still number one, I guess. Um, so renal vascular hypertension with a solitary kidney is primarily renin-mediated, catecholamine-mediated, aldosterone-mediated, or volume-mediated. Okay, well, actually, the, uh, the answer is volume-mediated. Um, I'm not sure what the red refers to. Is that supposed to be correct? Or the majority? But the correct answer is D, volume mediated, because what happens is if you've got a solitary kidney, um, the, uh, the, uh, although renin is increased initially, usually with the two kidney model, the contralateral kidney responds with a natriuresis and is able therefore to maintain uh, renin secretion as the main uh, reason for the maintained hypertension. But with a solitary kidney, there's no contralateral kidney to perform the natriuresis. So you end up with fluid retention and eventually the hypertension is just mediated by volume, increased volume. So it's a bit of a fine point, but the answer is volume mediated. Now, okay, this is the third question. Treatment of a 70% osteostenotic lesion in a normal tense of 70 year old with a syncreatin of 1.5 is observation, prophylactic aspirin, angioplasty or angioplasty with stenting. Okay, good. Um, the answer, correct answer is observation because basically you've got an asymptomatic patient with an incidental finding uh, and a relatively preserved serum creatinine. So you don't really want to intervene with that patient. You know if that, it's an atherosclerotic lesion because it's osteal and of, because of the patient's uh, age. So the uh, correct answer is observation. I think this must be the last question. So initial testing of a 40-year-old female with refractory hypertension is plasma renin activity, plasma metanephrines, Doppler ultrasound, CT angiography. Good, Doppler ultrasound is correct. It's non-invasive. Uh, and uh, it, it will provide good sensitivity. Uh, usually in a 40-year-old female, uh, it's uh, going to be a fibrous disease, so there isn't going to be a lot of uh, likely no, not, no body fat to deal with. Uh, so you wouldn't go to a CT angiogram as the initial test. Plasma metanephrines, you're looking for a pheochromocytoma, which uh, uh, would not be the initial testing before you did imaging. Um, so Doppler ultrasound is good. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Okay.
My pleasure. Thank you for hosting, Peter, uh, and uh, Michelle, for your invitation, and Kirsty.